welcome to the 700 Club, lawlessness in our streets, cancel culture shutting down our free speech, critical race theory poisoning our schools. The list goes on. Marxism has infiltrated our country and our America is under siege. So what can we do before it completely destroys our great nation? Mark Levin is going to be giving us the answer in his tremendous book called American Marxism. But first, CBN's Dale Hurd has more. A revolution against traditional American values is in full swing. Rioting and looting have decimated cities. Statues have been toppled. Cancel culture has sought to censor and marginalize conservative voices on social media. And school children are being taught critical race theory, that America was founded as a racist nation. Once only a fringe political movement, elements of Marxist ideology are now being pushed not only in schools, but in the media, corporations, government, and even the military. In his new book, American Marxism, TV and radio host and best-selling author Mark Levin warns this counter-revolution is devouring our society and culture. And Levin says Americans must confront Marxism in all its forms before this nation is lost. Well, Mark Levin joins us now by Skype. Mark, this book, American Marxism, is a classic. You have done a fantastic job. The scholarship is brilliant. And... Uh, I know it's a bestseller. Congratulations. Thank uh, you, Pat. Let me ask you something. Marxism has resulted in the death of at least 100 million people around the world. It's been a colossal failure. Why is it coming here to America? Because it's an easy out, Pat, I believe, for individuals who don't take responsibility for their own lives, for individuals who uh, are buying into this victimhood ideology and uh, can blame other people. It's the oppress oppressor Marxist model, uh, the victim, the victimizer. And so I think you really have two groups of people. You have uh, malcontents, people with very little connection to society, people who maybe have failed in their lives or so forth, and uh, they're looking for excuses. And then you have the fanatics that lead these movements uh, who are power hungry, who want to control society. We've had them in every form uh, all throughout humanity. And what it is, is it's this vicious, vile attack on the most fantastic country on the face of the earth. It's a rejection of Judeo-Christian uh, morality. You can see it uh, in our classrooms with the, with the transgender movement. Did you ever think you'd hear of a transgender movement? Um, uh, an attack on our uh, economic system, capitalism, an attack on citizenship with open borders. Uh, and they, you hear the language, even Biden, redistribution of wealth, the rich versus the poor, white versus black. Marxism has to have this going on, constant conflict, classes, caste systems. But America is not a country of classes and caste systems, so they have to manufacture it and create it. And they have to devour our educational system, which is what Marx would want them to do, and push indoctrination. They reject free speech. They're not interested in a competition of ideas. Uh, and you see this leeching into every aspect of our culture uh, and led by the media. And you can see that the Democrat Party has become the political voice and the political force for this movement. So I called the book after all this research, all the writing near the end of the book. I said, what is this? I said, it's Marxism, but it's an American form of Marxism. It may not be technically Marxism in every sense, but in terms of the scholarship you point out, I went back, what is the basis of critical race theory? Who invented this? Who invented critical theory? Who invented this open borders lat crit movement? Who invented this idea that there aren't binary sexes and, and that the family's coming under attack? These are all spawned American movements from Marxism. And we have to have the courage to call it what it is, Pat. But Mark, you, you, you talked about a guy named Marsus who who was the uh, philosophical head of it, but you've also pointed out a couple of law professors of all places at the University of Alabama who have been uh, at the forefront of this critical race theory, which is just a monstrosity. Can you want to talk about that? Yeah, there's, there's two of them in particular, and you're right. And um, they push this propaganda, 
They write about these books. You'll notice, Pat, they're never discussed on network TV. They're never really discussed anywhere. Instead, they bring out Kendi and Delgado, these most recent authors who are making millions and millions of dollars pushing Marxism, as a matter of fact, and, and uh, racist ideas. Uh, this is going on in our classrooms, in our schools, even the University of Alabama. It's going on in across the country. Our children are being indoctrinated. Our children, you send them off to college, maybe even pay their tuition. We, the state taxpayers, are subsidizing these universities and colleges. We have tenured Marxist professors who are poisoning one generation after another. Uh, and I have chapter in the book on, on breeding a mob, Hate America, Inc. We are subsidizing our own demise. And so what I say in the book is we better step up to the plate here. We can't rely on the Republican Party or some political savior to come forward. It is we the people. This is our 1776 moment without the violence. This, I'm hoping, is our American crisis, the pamphlet. We can't communicate through most of the media, Pat. You have this fantastic network. You know what else is going on out there. We can't communicate through social media. Maybe we have uh, your platform, some other platforms. But in terms of, of the broad population, I think r the written word and books, like the old pamphleteers, this is how we patriots who love this country, I don't care if you're a Democrat, Republican, Libertarian, moderate, whatever you are, if you love this country, we need to communicate with each other. We need to have a plan. We need to know what we're up against in order to combat it. And we need to get started because I think we're not at the precipice looking into the abyss. We're in the abyss trying to claw our way out. And they're brainwashing our little grandchildren and children in elementary school. And if that doesn't prod people to act, which I explained in the last chapter, then I don't know what will. Uh, you, you talked at length about Ayn Rand, who wrote that terrific book called Atlas Shrugged. But uh, her idea was that the success is now something that is bad, and we ought to take success about and humiliate people who are successful. Uh, is that the ultimate aim of Marxism, is to destroy success, destroy capitalism, destroy everything that we, uh, you know, gives us the kind of society we have? You're absolutely right. This is a war on liberty. They use liberty to destroy liberty, which was basically her point. They use the Constitution to destroy the Constitution. They use the fruits of capitalism to destroy capitalism. And people say, why do they think this way? because this is their religion. This is their faith. These are their false idols. They push religion out of the public square. They push people out of churches and synagogues. So what's left? Left is man praying to man, the most dangerous thing imaginable. That is what Marx is all about. Eliminate your history, eliminate faith, destroy the nuclear family. What's left? Government. And what does Marx say? He says what Hegel says and what Rousseau says. He actually stole it from them. Yeah. You need to surrender your individuality to the collective. Mm -hmm. Well, what's the collective? The collective is the government. So you're only going to be able to realize the fullness of your individuality if you surrender your liberty and your unalienable rights. To who? To Bernie Sanders? To AOC? To Joe Biden? Yes. That's the preaching. Well, was, was Marx a Satanist priest? Some thought that that uh, beard he wore indicated that he was really over the edge in that regard. Well, he's something like that, that's for sure, because his evil ideology, as you point out, resulted in the death of 100 million people and the enslavement of billions. And by the way, most people don't know, but you do, because you read the book, Pat, American Marxism. He was a journalist. That was his career. He wasn't like this great philosopher. He became sort of this ideologue, but he was a journalist, and he wrote for New York newspapers for 12 years. Um, uh, and after he died, it wasn't until 30 or 40 years later that people started picking up his ideological writings, including so-called self-anointed progressives in the United States who were very enamored with Marxism, John Dewey, uh, Woodrow Wilson, Crowley, and the others, and they adapted it to our educational system. This educational system was under attack a hundred years ago and every day since. And the media have bought off in this too. I write in the book where they're coming from that you won't find, Pat, a dime's worth of difference between the media and the positions of these Marxist spawned American movements, whether it's so-called climate change, which is a degrowth movement, an attack on capitalism, uh, whether it is a, a critical race theory, which is a racist Marxist attack, 
on, on our society or all the rest of it. The media are the mouthpieces for these movements, and the Democrat Party is the home. Well, uh, the so-called green movement, uh, how does that fit into this Marxist philosophy? Because in the 1970s, a cabal of Marxists got together in Europe, and, I, and as I point out in the book, and they, uh, they attack industrialized society, particularly America. Marx hated the Industrial Revolution because it proved Marxism to be a complete fraud. Why? The proletariat, that is the masses, didn't rise up and overthrow the country. We built the greatest middle class, happy people, people who are successful, people who earn a living, of any society on the face of the earth. The greatest capitalist system was the opposite of what Marx said it was. So they've been attacking the industrial uh, might of our country, smokestack industries, manufacturing, day in and day out ever since. You must destroy the industrialized heart of America. You must destroy capitalism for Marxism to succeed. And so this is the constant redistribution of wealth, massive confiscatory taxes, uh, anything they can think of, regulations and so forth, to hinder and undermine the American industrial might. And the first thing they attack, of course, and Biden attacked, was energy. You can't have a thriving economy. You can't have a well-priced consumer goods. Energy is the center of everything. If you're going to destroy energy, you're going to destroy our economic system. How are we going to fight it, Mark? Well, you know, Pat, it took 100 years to get here, and hopefully it'll take less. But at the end of the book, it's the most important book I've ever written. It's the longest book I've ever written. But at the end of the book, I provide scores of ideas of how to fight back against the corporatists who have surrendered to this and now cheerlead for this. The universities and colleges, we need to cut their funding, particularly in Republican states. I don't understand what's going on. If they're going to be using our money uh, to subsidize the destruction of the country, they ought to have less of our money. We need to go after the teachers' unions, and there are ways we can do that. They have their various IRS uh, uh, standards uh, when they file. Uh, we can file complaints against them. I've done it myself. There's a whole list of things in these different areas with links, with organizations. And Pat, I want to tell your audience, which is a magnificent audience, people of faith, mm -hmm. please read the book. Buy one and pass it around. <laughs> please do whatever you have to do. The time is now. This generation has to step up. This is daunting. It is complex. But we have no choice. It's in our face. Well, Mark, I, I congratulate you again. It's a tremendous book, ladies and gentlemen. It's very uh, brilliantly researched and eye-opening. So it's an easy read, but it's it's a deep read. Mark Levin, American Marxism. You don't need to get a copy wherever books are sold. And Mark, thanks so much for being with us. It's good to see you. Congratulations. And, and God bless you, and thank you for everything you do and you've done, Pat. Thank you, sir. Welcome back to the 700 Club. Should the Justice Department investigate Dr. Anthony Fauci? Kentucky Senator Rand Paul is making that case. In an exclusive interview with CBN News, Paul accuses Fauci of lying to Congress about NIH funding of research at the Wuhan Institute of Virology, which is at the center of the COVID-19 lab leak theory. Senator Paul spoke with our Capitol Hill correspondent, Abigail Robertson. Senator Rand Paul claims while we may never know the exact cause of the COVID-19 pandemic, he wants the Justice Department to investigate whether Dr. Fauci and the NIH are linked to gain-of-function research in Wuhan, China. The Chinese would have to admit to it. And if this virus came from their lab and they have record of that, my guess is that record's long ago been burned. That's why the senator is pushing to uncover any link to the NIH and Fauci. Do you wish to retract your statement of May 11th where you claimed that the NIH never funded gain-of-function research in Wuhan? Senator Paul, I have never lied before the Congress, and I do not retract that statement. But Paul claims research from the lab tells a different story. Dr. Xi, who's the one they call the bat scientist, she was doing research at that time, taking viruses that occur in animals, mutating them or recombining them with other viruses to create viruses that are not found in nature that actually can infect humans. Well, this is the very definition of what even the NIH says is gain-of-function research. Fauci disagrees. Senator Paul, you do not know what you are talking about, quite frankly, and I want to say that officially. 
Paul believes Fauci has reason to distance himself. I think Dr. Fauci has a conflict of interest because he was in charge of the funding. If the virus came from the lab, he has some sort of moral culpability. And he fears if we don't find out what happened, we could see another global pandemic. We still are funding this research in North Carolina and in uh, Galveston, and that there's a potential problem that uh, this could happen again with an even worse virus. Paul believes there's a lot of evidence supporting the Wuhan lab leak theory. They quit putting their viruses sequence, their DNA, RNA sequences online in the fall of 2019. Actually, even before we knew this was going on, they had taken offline their sequences so people couldn't look at this. And he isn't convinced it originated naturally. They tested 80,000 animals in the Wuhan wet markets, and none of them had COVID. They've taken COVID-19 and tried to infect bats with it, and it turns out it readily infects humans, but not bats which makes you suspicious about it coming from bats if it doesn't really readily infect bats. Paul would also like to see an investigation outside the World Health Organization and thinks the U.S. should reinstitute withholding funds to the WHO. Reporting from Virginia, Abigail Robertson, CBN News. Thanks, Abigail. Pat, no love lost between the two. Well, I, I congratulate uh, Senator Rand Paul on what he did. I think Fauci is a liar. I think that he is covering up the stuff that he's done and that uh, he and his associates are probably responsible for this gain of function thing. They, they took a, a fairly benign uh, virus and manipulated it and they did it with government money. And uh, although he himself didn't do it, he, he had several uh, intermediate organizations picking up the money. And uh, it wouldn't break my heart if they brought criminal charges against him for lying to Congress. But I don't know if, if Rand Paul is going to do that or pursue it or, or whether the Biden administration will do it or not. But uh, Anthony Fauci should not be the, the lead uh, man in terms of telling us whether we should wear masks or what we should do when we go to camp or what we should do about for, in vaccinating young people and so forth. I think he's a deeply flawed human being, and um, uh, the the anger he showed when he talked to the senator showed an arrogance that I, I think is unbecoming somebody. But people say, well, he's the head virologist, and we should listen to him rather than a, a doctor on the Senate committee. Well, that is your opinion, but mine, I salute Senator Paul on what he's doing. John. Pat, more drama on Capitol Hill, this time over congressional investigation into the January 6th riot, sparking accusations of an abuse of power. And now it appears there could be two rival investigations. George Thomas has more on the escalating controversy. Shortly after House Speaker Nancy Pelosi rejected the two Republican lawmakers at the center of the firestorm, Jim Banks of Indiana and Ohio's Jim Jordan, Minority Leader Kevin McCarthy pulled his remaining Republican nominees from the committee, saying the panel had lost all legitimacy and credibility. The House Select Committee investigating events surrounding the January 6th assault on the Capitol is scheduled to hold their first hearing next Tuesday. Pelosi didn't specify exactly what her objections were, but a Democrat told the Washington Post there were concerns about their past actions and statements. Banks has claimed the committee is politicized by the left, while Jordan may be called as a witness because he spoke with Trump on January 6th. The speaker claimed their appointments would impact the integrity of the investigation. When does the other team's coach get to determine who gets to play for our team? So we'll, we'll see what happens. But what I do know this is about, this is about attacking President Trump once again. Hours after their dismissal, Republican Kevin McCarthy, flanked by Jordan and Banks, said unless Pelosi reversed course and sat all five of his nominees, the Republicans would not participate. Pelosi has created a sham process. And it shows exactly what I warned back at the beginning of January, that Pelosi would play politics with this. McCarthy saying Republicans will conduct their own separate investigation instead. The American people deserve that. They don't deserve politics. They don't deserve destroying the institution. No committee in Congress will work if one person is picking all who can serve. 
Speaking at a CNN town hall in Cincinnati, the president said no one can downplay what happened on January 6th. I don't care if you think I'm Satan reincarnated. <laughs> the fact is, you can't look at that television and say nothing happened on the 6th. You can't listen to people who say this was a peaceful march. Meanwhile, Republican Liz Cheney of Wyoming, an outspoken critic of the president, was picked by Speaker Pelosi to serve on the Democratic Committee. Cheney accused the minority leader of being insincere, since he was against establishing an independent commission from the get-go. The rhetoric around this from the minority leader and from those two members has been disgraceful. Uh, this must be an investigation that is focused on facts. And the idea that any of this has become politicized uh, is really um, uh, unworthy of the office uh, that we all hold. Pelosi wants replacements for Banks and Jordan. Minority leader McCarthy declined, calling her move an egregious abuse of power. George Thomas, CBN News. All right. Thank you, George. Pat, back to you. Oh, five members of the House in the next election, the 19, uh, coming up uh, November next, uh, will determine the House. The, uh, Pelosi's going to lose the speakership. She's not going to be speaker anymore. And uh, uh, we'll see what happens. But at the, at the present time, with all the problems we've got in our society, people are out of work, people are looking for jobs, uh, small businesses are going under, uh, we're being overwhelmed by uh, threats from China and places such as that, and we're going to spend countless uh, hours and countless dollars determining about a riot that took place several months of years ago. I mean, is that something we want to do as America? The answer is no. It is strictly political. They want to tag the Republicans as being the party of insurrection, and they want to do it, to tie them into to Trump that they, they figure was an unpopular leader. And that, that's the game, and it's just strictly politics. But folks, this is a great country, and it's time our country begin to act like it. John? Pat, Florida Republicans are slamming the Biden administration for not doing enough to help the protesters in Cuba. In Miami's Little Havana, thousands of sympathetic protesters are turning out every day, calling on the U.S. government to support freedom in the communist nation. Wednesday night, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis attended a town hall meeting at a restaurant in Little Havana hosted by Fox News. He called on the Biden administration to support the freedom movement in Cuba. So from day one, the people of Cuba have been protesting and demonstrating against the communist dictatorship in Havana. It's not because of vaccines. It's not because of these side issues. They want a new government. They want to free Cuba. And it's, I think, incumbent upon us in, in the United States uh, to be supportive of those efforts. I've called on Joe Biden. The communist regime has shut down Internet. Let's work to beam Internet onto the island of Cuba so these folks have a fighting chance to converse with one another, to send what's going on to the outside world. World. Let's build an international coalition uh, so that the regime knows the free world stands with the people of Cuba. Some dueling uh, town halls there. Well, Pat, the Miami protesters say the Cuba's go uh, that Cuba's government is rounding up and imprisoning dissidents on the island. Uh, with Castro gone, Raul Castro is an old man, and the Cuban people would say, look, it's time for us to come free. The Cubans are incredibly uh, resourceful and intelligent. If you looked at Latin America, uh, when Cubans are involved, they, they often take the lead because they're just extremely able human beings. And uh, what has happened under Castro has been a disaster. Uh, yes, they do torture, they do imprison, they, they do terrible things to people. And uh, Raul is an old man, Fidel is now dead. And the human people are beginning to say, well, let's break loose. The thing that we've got to remember also in Venezuela, Maduro is a thug who has destroyed one of the wealthiest countries in the world, and he has completely destroyed it. Uh, he's a former, what was he, a taxi driver or something? I mean, he's, he's unequipped to run this. But the thing that keeps him in power are Cuban troops. Cuban troops, of course, some may be coming from the Soviet Union and other communist countries, 
but mainly Cuba. So if Cuba goes down, Maduro goes down, and there could be freedom in our hemisphere. And uh, I don't know what we could do to support those freedom lovers in, in Cuba, but uh, the time is to come. And DeSantis is saying, well, let's get the Internet to them. Well, I think it's going to take more than the Internet. It's going to take more than words. But uh, that country is just a basket case, and it was an island paradise and destroyed by communism. Terry? Five hard-hitting tackles. That's what Christian Abercrombie's parents watched him execute in the first half of a game. Then the linebacker for Tennessee State seemed to vanish. So what happened to Christian? And how did it lead to a miracle he never saw coming? We were very excited about the game. It was like any normal, you know, Saturday. September 29th, 2018. College football is in full swing. That day, Derek and Stacy Abercrombie drove from their home in Atlanta to Nashville to cheer on their son Christian, a linebacker for Tennessee State. TSU faced in-town rival Vanderbilt, a game that would permanently change Christian's life. When the game started, he was excited. He, I seen him bouncing around. It was very crowded. Um, it was hot. We were just excited, and then it changed. Christian was a highly touted prospect out of Atlanta's Westlake High School. He received nearly 30 Division I scholarship offers. His dream was to play in the NFL. He was a pretty big kid, and I've been around football a while to know the, the NFL caliber. Yeah, I had those thoughts in my head that he could make it. During the game, he was making plays, but he looked like he's kind of sluggish. He's out there, he's playing, but he's just not looking his normal speed. During the first half, Christian made five hard-hitting tackles. I found out something was wrong after halftime, and I looked in the area where the defensive players were located, and I did not see Christian. At that time, I began to um, kind of panic a little bit. The Abercrombies learned that Christian had collapsed and was rushed to Vanderbilt Hospital. When the nurse came in and she said that he was very ill and I needed to sign the consent forms because he's had a head injury, um, I was very puzzled and confused and I began to question her, you know, how did it happen? And she didn't have any answers other than we need to get him to surgery. Yeah, it was kind of something that we, you know, thought we'll never hear. Christian had suffered a traumatic brain injury and required a craniotomy, a removal of a piece of skull to relieve pressure on his brain. The Abercrombies met with the surgeon. He's telling us, you know, he may not wake up and he's given us the medical terminology of what occurred to Christian. And I remember, you know, we cried and I kind of fell on the floor a little bit. The operation was successful, but Christian was still in a coma. We was like, okay, that's enough. It's time to pray. We got to give it to God. We have to surrender. There's nothing that we can do that can change him. And at that moment, it just changed our entire perspective. Our prayer was, you know, Jesus get us through, you know, give him life. And we saying whatever that we can say that would give him any help through prayer. Derek and Stacy sent out an urgent message for friends and family to pray. And they were amazed by the response. There were hundreds of people in the waiting area, couldn't even fit in the chapel praying. And that was just a moment for me to say, it's not me, it's not about me, it's about God and what he can do. After nearly three long weeks, Christian awoke from his coma. I heard him kind of grunt. So I looked at him in the face and he was looking at me and I asked him, I said, can you hear me? Can you talk? And he looked at me and he kind of whispered, yes. Stacy says Christian's recovery is nothing short of miraculous. Oh, it was totally all a miracle. Um, from the surgeon um, stating it himself, he said, there's nothing that I did. There was nothing that I could do to change him. I did not expect to see you all in 24 hours. I did not think he would make it overnight. So it was all God. Christian was transferred to an Atlanta rehab facility to learn to walk again. Pretty challenging, but I worked through it. And I was tired some days, but I worked through it. It means a lot. I'm very happy and blessed. I couldn't do this without the man above. 
it brings chills to my body. And I can say I am closer to God. I love going to church now. I just love, I love praying. In May of 2021, Christian graduated from Tennessee State with an interdisciplinary studies degree. Today, he's bringing awareness to traumatic brain injuries through the Christian Abercrombie Foundation. Christian says he's thankful for praying parents. I appreciate them and I love them. I just want to thank them for the support and prayers. Without them, I don't know where I'd be. It could have been a different outcome to this, but I appreciate them so much. His parents credit his recovery to the power of prayer. While we're thinking that God is preparing him to be this um, overall number one draft pick in the NFL, that may not have been the plan all along. He was preparing him for this part of his life. When we wake up right now, I feel like every day I hit the lottery, you know, that's how happy I feel as far as how God has blessed us. My perspective on life have changed. Um, my faith has been built stronger. Um, I just feel as though, you know, without prayer, nothing is possible. God's perspective is so different than ours, isn't it? I think of the scripture, Pat, where he says, my ways are not your ways, they're higher than your ways. What an amazing story of faith and determination. Impossible, impossible. Yeah. Well, we have some, before we pray for all of you, we have some praise reports. This is Judith who uh, wrote by email and said, several months ago, I was diagnosed with blood cancer, mild at first, then steadily progressing. Then I heard Pat say, Someone was being healed of a strange blood cancer, so I claimed it. I continued to trust in faith that that message was meant for me. Today, I had a doctor's appointment, and there is no cancer after seeing the blood test. Praise God, it's gone. Hallelujah. That's a miracle. Here's one. Lydia, who lives in Victorville, California, uh, had a bone protruding from her spine. The doctor just said, look, Lydia, you're getting old. That's just part of aging. But she was watching this program on July the 9th, 2021, heard Terry give a word that somebody with a bone sticking out. Do you remember that? I don't remember a that. A bone That's sticking out. Lydia touched her back, claimed the healing. She felt the uh, area, the protruding bone was now completely wow. flat. Thank the Lord. Folks, God does miracles. You realize he created the world. He created you from nothing. He breathed on a little bit of dust and whew, you became a living soul. So God can do anything. He's, he's not restricted whatsoever. So what we're going to do is join hands together and we want to pray for you in this program. We want to believe God for miracles. We see miracles. We have seen thousands and thousands of things that God has done. So all I can say with you is please don't fight it. Just say, Leah, Lord, I receive it. I receive it. So we join hands. Mm. And Father, we thank you for the anointing. We thank you for this healing of this young man. We thank you for healing of these people we talked about on the program. And we thank you, Lord. Mm. Uh, Michael, you've got a neck problem. Uh, mm -hmm. there's, you, you, you really uh, hurt a tendon in your neck. It may be a whiplash. Just touch it in the name of Jesus. Healing, uh, Terry. Yes, someone else, you've had an appendectomy and you're having some kind of a, a follow-up problem with that. Not sure what it is, if it's infection or what, but pain on your right side. God's healing that for you right now. You're just going to feel you. that mildly go away and it'll be gone. Marcy, uh, you've been diagnosed with breast cancer and uh, they, they talk about metastatic. It's, it's mm -hmm. spreading, but right now, Believe God in the name of Jesus that the cancer is completely healed in Jesus' name. Touch her. Yeah. Terry. Someone else, you have had a serious toe injury. I mean, it actually affects your ability to wear shoes, the way that you walk. Uh, it just seems like it's not healing. God is healing that for you right now. And that pain and the swelling is going to slowly go away and you'll be able to walk normally again in Jesus' name. Now, Richard, you've got a cracked rib. And uh, uh, it's it's painful, and and God's healing the rib right now. The, you you will not penetrate the spine. You are come up in your lung. I mean, and God has healed you in Jesus' yeah. name. Someone else with an audio problem. I think it's your right ear, but God's healing that condition for Thank you. It's you. restored in Jesus' name. 
and all over this world. We pray again for our nation. We ask, Lord, this is a center of freedom. Lord, we pray that you don't allow the forces of evil to overcome this great land, but make us, make us as a nation worthy of, of your blessing, that we might say, God bless America. May it be there, Lord, because we are worthy. And Lord, we're not, we're not worthy now. We dwell in the midst of an unclean mm. nation, and our eyes have behold the Lord. So, Lord, cleanse our nation that we might be worthy of your blessing. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Mm -hmm. Please go to your phones and let us hear what has happened to you. We love to have these reports. We love to share them. And it's 1-800-700-7000. That's an easy number to remember. So please call. And uh, we, by the way, if you want prayer, we got folks on the phones who love you, love to pray for you. Again, 1-800-700-7000. No money involved. Just call. Somebody loves you. Okay. Welcome back to Washington for the CBN News Break. Senate Republicans are firing a warning shot at Democrats over high price spending bills, threatening to vote against raising the federal debt ceiling this month. Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell saying he doesn't believe any Republican will vote to allow Washington to raise it. Failing to raise the debt ceiling by July 31st means the government could run out of money sometime in August. Well, wildfires continue their rampage in western states. The bootleg wildfire in Oregon expanding up to four miles a day, so far burning more than 394,000 acres. Firefighters battling flames on both sides of California's Sierra Nevada mountains. This wildfire in Redding burned at least eight buildings. Power company PG&E saying equipment may have sparked the fires. Now moving to spend $15 billion to bury miles of power line and reduce outbreaks. Wildfires also causing air pollution cross-country, including in Philadelphia, where haze is filling the skies. Well, you can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website at CBNNews.com. Well, she was a Dallas Cowboy cheerleader, a top 30 American Idol finalist, and a TV host. He was a football player, a Hollywood stuntman, and a comedian. But none of that brought Kristen and Danny Adams worldwide fame. So what did? Take a look. Lip-sync sensations Kristen and Danny Adams became YouTube stars overnight when their video, which has now been watched over 300 million times, went mega viral. Although this duo believes laughter is the best medicine, they're quick to point out they're not perfect and don't have it all together. In their book, The Road to Love and Laughter, Kristen and Danny share challenges they've faced in their marriage and tools they've discovered to help keep joy throughout the journey. Please welcome to the 700 Club, Kristen and Danny Adams. It's good to have you both with us. Thank you, Terry. Thanks so much for having us. Well, Danny, let me start with you. How did you and Kristen meet? We met in Hollywood. I'm from Indianapolis originally. Kristen's from Dallas, Texas. But we met in Los Angeles, <laughs> and we were at a little chili party of the, some friends were throwing a little party that was serving chili. It was like a chili, come over and have some chili yeah. with some Southern Midwest people. That's right. And so I was there. Um, I knew everyone in the room. And then Kristen walks in and she was the new girl. And I'm like, hey, who's the pretty new girl? Let's go introduce ourselves to her. I didn't even remember the first time we met. I was telling a different version of it for a long time. And I, and then Danny leaned over and he's like, babe, we actually met before that at the house party. It was a big deal for for me, apparently not for you, mm. but um, we were both out, like you mentioned, pursuing careers in entertainment. Yeah. I was out for American Idol, and we met at this house party, and that yeah. was how our friendship began. Well, yeah. it's, I it's, put it in my back. Obviously, she didn't. <laughs> <laughs> it's a tough road to hoe out in L.A. Kristen, you burned out in the Hollywood spotlight. Tell us what happened. Well, I auditioned for the first season of American Idol. Like, 20 years ago, you guys. Um, uh, so I, yeah, I made it to the top 30 uh, in the in season one when Kelly Clarkson won. And that 
drastically changed the trajectory of my life. Mm -hmm. um, I, I found myself from you know a college dorm room when I was going to TCU, and then all of a sudden, overnight, I'm on a stage in LA singing and asking people to call in and vote, you know, for me. And I ended up getting voted off right when they went from, from the top 30 to the top 10. So I always tell people I'm number 11 on season one because I could have been. Right? Totally um, <laughs> and so after that, then they asked me. Um, to come back, well, I actually asked for a job on the second season, and I was like, hey, I love television hosting. I mean, singing was mm -hmm. great, but after being in Hollywood and watching you know, Seacrest host the show and all these things, I was like, that's a better deal because Simon Cowell doesn't judge his work at the end of, of his <laughs> segment, you know? <laughs> I was like, I'll do that, and, and they actually gave me a job. And um, I talk about that in, in our book about mm -hmm. just asking. You never know, like you could be one step away from some amazing, amazing thing. We just have to ask. And so um, they brought me on the second season and that's what started a hosting career for me. I was like the hardest working cable television host that no one knew for 15 years in Los Angeles. So, um, <laughs> uh, but like, like you mentioned, that was, you know, that was, it was a 15 year uh, career for both Danny and I in the entertainment industry, but, but really like the purpose driven stuff that's like, blowing our minds right now to yeah. watch has really been happening in the last five years since we started making videos for the internet. Well, Danny, you and Kristen wound up in the course of all of this in your relationship living together. And then what happened after the two of you started going to church? Wow. Yeah, we were, yeah, we, as, as a dating relationship, we had the high highs and the low lows. And at that time, which was now 15 some years ago, we just had no coping methods at the time. We were very immature. Uh, we weren't going to church regularly. We weren't regularly. going to church. We weren't making Christ Lord of our life. Uh, but uh, but yeah, we just we just yeah, I think it was the crazy cycle that we were in of having no coping methods, dragging old fights into current fights, and and I just knew that there had to be a change. And I knew in my heart, I was convicted that I just wasn't I just wasn't making the Lord the throne, you know, giving Him the throne of my heart. And so so I went to church, asked Kristen if she would go with me. And it really scared me, Terry, because this was back when we were dating. Mm -hmm. um, we both grew up in the church, um, but had kind of fallen away from mm -hmm. with our with our walks with the Lord mm -hmm. out in LA. And so we were living together before we were married. We were doing all these things that um, we just knew was out of, out of order. God's order. Yeah. And so Danny gets the crazy idea in the midst of our fights and all those things that we should start going to church. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't really feeling it at first. Cause I'm like, I grew up, I, I grew up in the belt buckle of the Bible belt in Dallas. Like I've been to church my whole life. It's, it, it feels good, but yeah. it's, it's not going to help the mess that, that we're in. Yeah. And so he's like, well, we're, we're going. So I went, he instantly rededicates his life to Jesus that day. Mm -hmm. And it scared me cause I had to go home with him. And <laughs> what, does that mean? what does that mean? Yeah. You know? And, and so he like starts reading the Bible every day and and then when I would start my normal things of like trying to, you know, pick a fight or whatever it was, and he wasn't fighting back mm -hmm. as much because, you know, Jesus was in his heart now and, and he had the fruits of the spirit operating. I'm like, this is not fun anymore. He is not fighting back and I have something to say. And yeah. it just really kind of, you know, it was like a hornet's nest. It like stirred the hornet's nest of things that were going on in our relationship, mm -hmm. but ultimately for the good, you know, like yeah. we had to deal with these issues. We ended up moving out. Yeah. Um, and, and, and during our dating relationship for three years, a year and a half, we dated without the Lord in our life and we were living together. Like I said, all those mm -hmm. things, we move out, we break up. I rededicate my life to Jesus about eight months after Danny did. Right. And then we dated again, but we tried our best to yeah. pursue with God in our life at that point. You know, I, I just want to jump in here and say again how God uses everything, especially the hard things we go through to teach us lessons and then to allow us to share that with other people. We have just a minute left. Can you tell us about your lip sync video that went mega viral? You had to be shocked. We were yeah, shocked. We, were shocked. <laughs> um, we, we moved from LA to, to Indiana five years ago. That was like a God thing too that we oh don't God. have time to tell you about this. But we, we get to Indiana, we start posting videos on the internet every week. And all of a sudden we post this one on a Sunday night, we would go to bed and we wake up the next morning and we thought our Facebook page was broken because the, the counts just kept going up by the millions and people started following us from all over the world. And then we started getting all these comments. You guys are too pleasing to God. You look amazing, your marriage must be great. And we were like, wait, no, we have issues too, just like everybody else. <laughs> 
Well, I want to mention to folks that your book is called The Road to Love and Laughter, Navigating the Twists and Turns of Life Together. It's available where books are sold. Thank you, both of you. What a wonderful story of God taking what was tough and making something special out of it. Great to have you with us today. Thank you. A muddy creek full of water contaminated by E. coli. That was all a girl named Rixie and her family had to drink. But not anymore, thanks to people like you. Rixie's whole village now has clean, fresh water. Rixie and Miley are best friends. They go to school together in this mountain community in Honduras. We love each other. That's why we are always together. But Rixie and Miley's families faced a crisis. Their only source of water had been this old tank, which rusted and then began to leak. Everyone was forced to look for alternative sources of water. The only place Rixie and her mom could find was a muddy creek. It turns out the water contained E. coli. One day I drank water from there. My stomach hurt. I had a lot of diarrhea and vomiting. I couldn't attend school for 15 days because I was so sick. Of course, Miley wondered why her best friend was missing from class. Over the next few weeks, she became Rixie's teacher at home. She taught me how to do the schoolwork. I was very happy because I was not left behind in school. Then Operation Blessing came to visit the community. Working with volunteers, we began to build them a new water system, including this new tank, which is now filled with purified water for everyone to drink. Rixie is now back to school with her friend and She's happy to learn that the new system also provides fresh water for her school as well. I love you so much. You brought me clean water and it's really close to my house. My brother and I don't get sick anymore because we have clean water at home and school. Thank you. You say, well, I didn't know Rixie. I haven't been to Honduras. Well, you have. As a member of the 700 Club, we've gone in your name and we've helped people like Rixie and her village get clean water. Just think of that, what a wonderful blessing. Now, we'd like you to participate in helping people like Rixie and her, her community. It's so simple, it's the 700 Club, it's just $20 a month, it's 65 cents a day, and all you have to do is pick up the phone and call 1-800-700-7000. And when you do, I wanna send you something called God is For Us, Verses of salvation, peace, and victory. And that's going to be our gift to you when you join the 700 Club. Well, this is Patty from Marble Falls, Texas. She loved it. Pat says it's wonderful, has it in her car, and listens to it over and over while she drives. I am so. delighted. We're, yes. we're going to work on Ephesians next, but that's the first one we got. So. Awesome. And okay, we've got a so. question, an email question for you. This is one I don't remember ever coming up before. This is Cynthia, who says, My very good friend who believes in God used to belong to a nudist camp. She's talking about becoming a member again. And I just feel like I need to. To distance myself from her because it's so wrong before God. I just wanted your opinion on it. She sees nothing wrong with it and used to try to get me to go. You know, I used to jog when I was a little younger and wherever I was, I liked to go out jogging. So I was in Munich in Germany and uh, I was taking a jog around in this park. And guess what? There were a whole <laughs> lot of nudists there. Seriously. And you talk about something unappealing. You look at a lot of fat, naked Germans out in a park. It is the most, it is the most unappealing thing in this world. <laughs> okay, so you want to join a nudist colony? I, you know, I, I, I don't see anything sinful about it, but it may be a little stupid. Yeah, <laughs> right. yeah a little unpleasant. <laughs> okay, well, I guess that's the way. I wish we had more time, but we don't. Well, today's power minute is from First Thessalonians. May the Lord make you increase and abound in love to one another and to all, just as we do to you. Tomorrow, we've got an all-terrain wheelchair. An amazing discovery is taking unreached people group into the great out of doors. Well, for Terry and all of us, thanks for being with us. We thank you so much for sharing today. And uh, I guess I'll be seeing you next Monday. Okay, see you later. God bless you.